Good morning and welcome to today's webinar in Knowledge Miles, the 695th Lord Mayor's Lecture. Um, today we have a really great lecture in store um, entitled Why the Wreck of the Gloucester in 1682 Matters, the Secrets of a Restoration Warship. In this free online lecture series, we address the connections in and around the Square Mile, the World Coffee House, and how these might help us tackle future global challenges. I'm Giles Richardson, Senior Archaeologist at the Maritime Archaeology Sea Trust, and I'll be convening this session and moderating the question and answer portion of today's lecture. Before we begin, um, a little bit of housekeeping from me. My job, as always, is to get out of the way as soon as possible. Um, so we'll formally start proceedings at 11.05 uh, when I shall introduce our keynote presentation. Um, and that will run until approximately 11.25, possibly 11.30, when we'll move to the question and answer phase. And I've been told we have a hard deadline of 11.45 um, to end the session today. Um, without further ado, let me introduce the speaker for today's lecture. We are absolutely delighted to have Claire Jowett, Professor of Renaissance Studies at the University of East Anglia, presenting this morning. Claire is Principal Investigator on the Lever Human Trust funded project, Wreck of the Gloucester, the life and times of a 17th century third-rate English warship. She was curator for the recent exhibition in 2023 at Norwich Castle um, on the last voyage of the Gloucester, Norfolk's Royal Shipwreck, 1682. Um, and she has published widely, including seven books and more than 50 essays and chapters on maritime history and culture. She currently co-edits Amsterdam University Press's Maritime Humanities 1400-1800 series, Cultures of the Sea. And she's currently elected member and trustee of the Council of Halluk Society and the Society for Nautical Research. So without further ado, Claire, over to you. Thank you, Giles. And thank you, everybody, for attending this morning's lecture. I'm delighted uh, to be here. Um, I'll just give you a tiny little bit of context before I start on my lecture proper. Uh, UEA uh, joined the project to work on the Gloucester in 2019, uh, and we, we joined under a, an NDA, under a non-disclosure agreement, uh, with Leverhulme Trust funding, uh, with Dr. Ben Redding, also of UEA, I'm co-writing a cradle-to-grave history of the Gloucester warship. As many of you know, I'm sure the wreck was found in 2007 by Norfolk Historic Shipwrecks, uh, licensed divers, Julian and Lincoln Barnwell, and uh, their friend, tiny James Little, uh, discovered it, and the discovery was publicly announced in 2022. As Giles very kindly said, I was a co-curator um, of the inaugural exhibition on the Gloucester in 2023. This was done in partnership um, uh, with uh, Norfolk Museum Service, two co-curators from there, and with uh, Ben Redding. Um, it was also done in partnership with Norfolk Historic Shipwrecks and was supported by the Gloucester 1682 Trust. And I'll talk a little bit about that at, at the end. Uh, we were delighted to have about 70,000 people uh, visiting the exhibition. Um, so that's the, the kind of the background context, and I will now move on to talking about uh, 1682 uh, and what happened to the Gloucester. So just a little summary to remind you, or, or if you, if, 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 if uh, of what of what those key events were. So the final voyage of the Gloucester, a third-rate speaker-class royal frigate of approximately 755 tonnes. It's a substantial ship, a little bit bigger, to give you context, than the Mary Rose. And it sinks, when en route to, Gloss, uh, uh, to, to Scotland, very early in the morning of the 6th of May, 1682. And it's lost off the East Anglian coast. Uh, the ship isn't a new ship, it's actually a Commonwealth, a Cromwellian warship launched in 1654, uh, involved in very many battles off the East Anglian coast, uh, the Anglo-Dutch Wars, of course. Also, it had served in the Caribbean. Uh, it's been uh, comprehensively refitted in the late 1670s, so it's looking tippy-top in 1682. The disaster takes place at 5.30 a.m. when the ship 
strikes a sandbank. The ship is packed with about 350 people or so. There's no muster list, so we, we, we don't know for sure. It's rated to have 270 crew, but we think it's traveling also with about 80 passengers plus their servants. The Gloucester was underwater in less than an hour. Uh, and again, we don't know how many people died, but up to, probably we hope a, a little bit less, but up to uh, 200 people sadly drowned that morning. And the Gloucester was transporting this man. So next slide, please. Prince James, the younger brother of Charles II and known as the Duke of York and Albany in 1682, later King James II and VII, and he's traveling with his court. Uh, in 1682, Charles II is starting to age. Um, uh, and of course, that means that uh, James as the coming man, as the heir to the throne, uh, is attracting you know, significant attention from courtiers. But he's traveling also, as I've said, to Scotland. So he's accompanied by uh, a, a number of very significant Scottish uh, politicians uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. James is traveling to Scotland to bring his pregnant wife, Mary of Modena, and family to reside permanently at the English court. They've been sent to Scotland in 1679 because James's Catholicism had provoked uh, an exclusion crisis when Protestants had sought to exclude James from the succession. Uh, next slide, please. This painting by Johann Dankertz is probably the first picture created of the shipwreck. But how accurate is it? The Gloucester uh, is shown here striking a sandbank, of course, uh, but it shows uh, uh, it's striking on its bow when in fact it was the rudder at the stern that got caught on the sandbank. The ship is shown beached, though survivors accounts say the sandbank was covered with three fathoms, that's uh, over five meters of water. The sandy beach implies that all the crew and passengers on board will be saved. Three men are shown praying on the sandbank, although it's unclear whether they're praying for deliverance or in thanks for their survival. The sea appears to be calm, but we know it was choppy that day. Other naval vessels are shown on the horizon, apparently taking no action to help. Yet it was the rescue boats from the accompanying yachts that saved most lives as they fished survivors out of the sea. If Dankard's picture had been accurate with its calm sea and its sandy beach, then probably nobody would have lost their life that morning. Worth noting too are a couple of other features in the left foreground, a densely packed ship boat contains the Duke of York and other survivors. One of the criticisms uh, of James after this shipwreck was that his rescue boat was deliberately underfilled. Also, as the boat rose towards the waiting fleet, several men in red coats, meaning that they are royal servants, are shown brandishing swords and other weapons. They're attacking the victims in the water, trying to clamber aboard the rescue boat. Amongst this bloody drama, James sits impassively. From survivors' accounts, we know that in the other rescue boats that got away from the ship before it sank, that this did happen, that people trying to scramble in were prevented and prevented violently. Accounts of James's conduct suggest he did allow some other victims to be pulled into his boat. It's an interesting painting, I think, showing how the events of the wreck were being imaginatively recreated shortly after it happened. And we were privileged enough to borrow it from the National Maritime Museum for the exhibition last year. It's now on show in Time and Tide Museum in Great Yarmouth, a fantastic museum. I do recommend you go and get up, and clo up close and personal with this picture. So I'm just going to move on to, to talk about now why this 
wreck matters. Uh, next slide, please. This shipwreck is one of the most important almost moments in British history. Uh, and I'm going to invite us to think about several historical what ifs. What if James had drowned in 1682? British history would have been profoundly different. When Charles II died in 1685, one of his illegitimate sons, probably this man, James Scott, Duke of Monmouth, might have become king, a different James II than seventh. Monmouth had nine children by 1685, so Stuart absolute rule based on the divine right of kings might never have ended. Next slide, please. Or James's Protestant daughter Mary might have become queen when Charles II died in 1685. Then there would have been no so-called glorious revolution of 1688 when Mary's husband, uh, William of Orange, invaded and James II was exiled. The 1688 revolution established an English Bill of Rights, limiting the powers of the monarch and increasing the rights of Parliament. The divine right of monarchy might again have persisted. Next slide, please. Finally, European history would have been profoundly different if John Churchill, later the Duke of Marlborough, on board as James's closest advisor, had drowned. He led the nation's army to win key battles, such as the Battle of Blenheim in 1704. And if Franco-Bavarian forces had won, then the outcome of the whole War of Spanish Succession might have looked very different. Arguably, James, uh, Churchill's survival is more important than, than James's to British history. So briefly for a few minutes, I'm going to take us back to 1682 to think about the way this voyage went so horribly, tragically wrong and to suggest some further reasons why the Gloucester and its wreck are important. Next slide, please. And here we have the most fantastic um, drawing of a, a cut, cut cut through of the Gloucester uh, made by a, a, a wonderful maritime artist, Richard Enzer. And it's showing just how substantial a ship, just how um, you know good this ship was looking in 1682. Uh, very nicely, you can see two little people uh, on the deck of the ship. That's uh, James, Duke of York in the blue. He's five foot 11 and this is done to, to scale. Um, and then he's talking to, with his back to us, that's John Churchill. He's five foot eight. Uh, so we've got those rather nicely figured there. Uh, so the Stuart brothers actually, incidentally, they're tall men. Uh, James at 5'11", uh, Charles is over six foot, so unusually tall. We have a third little figure uh, represented at, at, at the front near the, near the, uh, the beak of the ship, and uh, he is sat on the seat of ease, and I will say no more about that. Next slide, please. So... Out of sight of land on the 5th of May, 1682, it's clear that the naval officers and the Duke, the Duke of York, disagree with the pilot over the best course to take to avoid the treacherous Norfolk sandbanks. Should they hug the coast and navigate by landmarks, as the pilot James Ayres advised, or should they sail far out to sea to avoid them altogether? the course that all the others wanted. This argument takes place over several hours, and it seems that the pilot kept wanting to tack, uh, to sail towards the land, but when the Duke finally gave him permission to do so, uh, the ship wasn't past the sandbanks, uh, and what turned out to be uh, a middle course took the Gloucester right into the sandbanks. Um, and here, you've uh, got uh, uh, 
a, a, a contemporary 1675 uh, map of uh, the East Anglian coast and all the sandbanks. And very importantly, and very uh, you know, catastrophically, the Lehman and our sandbanks, the sandbanks the Gloucester hit, are shown in the wrong place. Um, uh, the pilot says um, that uh, the sandbanks have moved uh, when he is uh, court-martialed for this later, and it's quite likely that this is actually true. So when the ship hits, it bumps along the sandbank and gets caught by its rudder, which eventually comes off, quickly filling the, uh, the Gloucester with water. The crew try to pump out the water, but to no avail, and James initially delays leaving the ship, hoping that the ship could be saved, it was, after all, a hugely valuable piece of kit, having, as I said at the beginning, just been comprehensively and expensively refitted. Under pressure from his advisers, principally John Churchill, who we've already met, um, James is persuaded to abandon ship just before it sinks, leaving no time to organise a proper evacuation for everybody else. Uh, then, as now, only after royalty leave can others on board look to their own safety. And just two more boats had time to launch. One swiftly overturns and the other, overcrowded, narrowly avoids sinking. Now, even though James survives the wreck, he's uh, uh, taken on to one of the accompanying yachts. The Gloucester's not sailing alone. It's got uh, uh, five accompanying yachts, four uh, big ships uh, with it. Uh, James goes on to the Mary and he's in Scotland pretty quickly. Uh, he thinks that's important so that rumours of uh, uh, his death don't prematurely spread across the nation. So even though he, 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 he survives, identifying who was to blame for such a major tragedy is a significant political and naval question. As a result, two court martials are held in June 1682 to determine responsibility, presided over, next slide please, uh, by this gentleman, Captain Richard Haddock, controller of the Navy. And I have a little Tintin character just uh, nestling in there because the Haddock family, uh, Richard Haddock, does in, indeed inspire uh, that character. The first held in 6 June 1682, the first court martial, is brought against the pilot Ayres. He's condemned to life imprisonment. In fact, a year later, on the 5th of June 1683, Charles II orders his release. Uh, and I think it's clear that if really uh, people had thought that, that, that Ayres was, was trying to do something very sinister, uh, that that, that uh, sentence would not have been uh, uh, he would not have been released a year later. The second court-martial was brought against Christopher Gunman. Next slide, please. One of the yacht captains for failing to follow Admiralty orders requiring a ship to warn adequate, adequately accompanying vessels of impending danger. Since his yacht, the Mary, was sailing in front, it's required, taking soundings, it's required to alert the Gloucester of shallow water by firing a gun. Now, Gunman admits that he had ordered flags to be waved instead, which he claims is normal practice. He was found guilty of misconduct. Gunman is imprisoned, fined and dismissed from his post. Uh, Gunman is quite a, 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 an excitable character. Uh, he writes uh, an extensive account of what happens, and he is apoplectic with fury. He claims that witnesses who give evidence against him had also attempted to intimidate others into giving false testimony about his neglect of duty. Uh, next slide, please. And he even draws, as you can see, here, a map of what actually happened. You can see the Charlotte yacht, the Gloucester, and the Mary yacht. And Gunman plots the course that the, the Mary took uh, so that when it found itself in shallow water, it, it veers off uh, and then it mounts a rescue effort. 
So Gunman says that there is a plot against him and that there's a conspiracy against him. And our research has uncovered evidence of attempted witness tampering against Gunman to get him to say that he neglected his duty. But who arranged that witness tampering remains a mystery. Gunman says Haddock is prejudiced against him, but to date we haven't yet found evidence that Haddock is behind the conspiracy, but we know that this one. So we've got a gun, but we don't know whose fingerprints are on it at the moment. Now, one reason Gunman might have been scapegoated was his close relationship with the Duke of York, who was known to be heavily reliant on him. Uh, Gunman had been based in Scotland with the Duke of York all through the exclusion crisis, uh, where, where James had been sent to Scotland because his Catholicism uh, was starting as the heir to the throne, was uh, starting to destabilise his brother's regime uh, as Protestants sought to exclude James uh, due to his religion from inheriting. So he's been like a royal taxi to uh, James in many ways uh, and, and knows James's secrets. So it's possible, we think, that by convicting Gunman, a message was being communicated to James concerning royal interference in the Navy. The return of James to political power in London uh, in 1682, as I said, he's, he's been uh, stationed in Scotland, um, is likely to shake up naval policy and senior admiralty officers fear that he's likely to attempt to influence future strategy. James had been Lord High Admiral until 1672, uh, 73, when his Catholicism had become known about and you, you couldn't then hold, hold office if you were a Catholic uh, after the Test Act was introduced. Um, he had remained Lord High Admiral of both Scotland and Ireland and was clearly hoping to resume that role in England. So he was going to shake up the Navy. Really interestingly, Gunman does not languish in prison for long. James intervenes on his behalf and Gunman is reinstated to his role as captain of the Mary within, wait for it, 10 days of his conviction. Heirs has a year to wait. Gunman is back at work in his job uh, and, and Ayres is never allowed to be in the, in, in the Navy again. Uh, but Gunman is back in his job within 10 days. So. What these naval intrigues suggest is that in 1682, the Duke of York remains a controversial figure. The tragedy of the Gloucester casts a long shadow, even though its full polit political effects are not immediately felt. The events on the Gloucester raise pointed questions about James's judgment under pressure, his fitness to rule, and his attitude to the governance of the Navy, a really significant branch of state apparatus in the 17th century. And harbingers for the decisive wreck of James's ship of state in 1688 are evident in the sinking of the Gloucester. Key individuals involved with the Gloucester, such as John Churchill on board with James, or Richard Haddock, tasked to establish culpability for the wreck, choose to desert to William and Mary rather than to maintain James as both commander and pilot of the nation. What happened on the Gloucester matters. I want to finish by showing you, so next slide please, another way why the Gloucester matters, uh, giving you a, a glimpse of the wreck site. Uh, and here, this is uh, photogrammetry, so 4,000 images stitched, stitched together by Maritime Archaeology Trust, Gary Momba, uh, spearheaded this work. You can see uh, a whole series of cannons, more than 20 cannons on that starboard uh, part of the wreck. It's a very compact wreck site, 30 to 50 metres. Um, and uh, the, the cannon, it's a really heavily armed ship. We think it was carrying 54 cannon in 1682. Um, at certain parts when it's going to, at times in history when it's going to war, it has even more than that. It's a real fortress. Um, next slide, please. 
this is just a, a, a real whistle stop tour here you've got um Junin and Lincoln Barnwell measuring one of the, of the cannon uh uh, the, the, the it, it's it's truly amazing what 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 is down there uh, about uh, nine feet I think that cannon uh, next slide please here's some of the artifacts so uh, a pair of spectacles um, discovered in a textile bundle uh, next slide please the velvet is still present in that spectacle case. Here, a better view of the spectacles, a really intimate object, a really high tech object of the time. It looks like it, it was in a, a, a bundle of, of mending. Next slide, please. And I will happily talk about um, the artifacts in, in questions if people are interested. Here, the bell uh, recovered in 2012. It's got uh, very importantly, a date on it, 1681. Uh, the, the, wreck, the wreck that the Norfolk Historic Shipwrecks discovered might have been the Kent, which sank uh, in a very similar place in 1672. But here, with 1681 on this bell, um, it, it couldn't be the Kent. The bell weighed about 19 stone when it was first recovered. It went to uh, conservation. It was full of concretization. And now it's about 11 stone. Uh, next slide, please. A, a selection of artifacts, Bellarmine jugs, uh, spoons. Some of them have got notches on them, initials on them, because in, in this period of history, you don't want someone like, like today, you don't want someone to go off with your pen. You don't want someone to go off with your with your spoon, a, a tankard lid, and there are wooden staves uh, uh, that accompany that tankard. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's more of the spoons um, with initials on, and 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 some have got little notches on. Next slide, please. Um, one of the truly extraordinary things about the artefacts recovered is the number of wine bottles or parts of wine bottles. To date, 542 um, artefacts have been rescued. 149 of them are wine bottles or parts of wine bottles. 49 of those bottles have some, con some liquid contents. 29 of them have full liquid contents, including the, the little bit of air, the ullage that um, is, is placed between the liquid and the cork. And a number of them have uh, glass seals on them, some of which are you know, parts of coats of arms or quite distinctive. Here's an RH in a sun in splendor. Uh, next slide, please, there's a selection of the bottles on the next one. You can see they're all different shapes, meaning that they're all different ages. So wine bottles are reused in this period of history, but wine with its much uh, weaker um, alcohol content than our wine today is drunk young. And there is the Sun in Splendor bottle. It's a quarter size bottle. And that shape, that shaft and globe with the long neck and the rounded shoulders means that it's a, an older bottle. As the century progresses, bottles tend to get shorter necks and, and more angular sh shoulders uh, for, for increased stability. Uh, next slide, please. I can bore for Norfolk on uh, wine uh, and, and bottles. There are no human remains have been recovered to date, but a, a series of animal bones, um, pork um, and beef primarily, uh, and uh, one sheep bone has been recovered. Uh, we don't know whether human remains are going to be recovered. Uh, we think it's probably unlikely, so less likely to be like the Mary Rose, where a, a lot of uh, human remains have been found a bit more like the Vassa, where it was if someone had got trapped under a heavy object, a cannon. Uh, we think the forces probably forced out uh, bodies as the ship sank, um, uh, or people just jumped into the sea. There are multiple accounts of people actually jumping into the sea. But it's, I, I, I anticipate if there is further excavation or actual excavation, probably some human remains will be found. Uh, next slide, please. A button. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, next slide, please. Navigational dividers uh, in really good condition. Uh, some of them have got personal, you know, personal initials on them. Um, 
their steel pointers are missing, but otherwise uh, uh, in, in really fine condition. Next slide, please. Uh, the textiles. Uh, these are the, the, the two. Uh, uh, there's two of these. Uh, they are um, silk, uh, silk petticoats. Next slide. We're coming very close to the end. A uh, trumpet mouthpiece. I can say more, but I won't. Next slide, please. Uh, a pewter porringer, probably a bleeding bowl. There are three physicians on board. I, again, uh, much more to be said. Next slide. I don't think you need me to say what this is. Uh, a, a urine specimen jar. Next slide, please. If you want to know more, um, Ben Redding has published an article in uh, the History Journal uh, about the um, first voyage of the Gloucester to the Caribbean in the 1650s. I've published an article, these are open access, uh, about the last voyage in English Historical Review. Final slide, please. And if you want to know more about the Gloucester 1682 Trust and the work that it is doing and hoping to do uh, and to, 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 to get a newsletter, then uh, there's a, a, a website address there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Claire. That was um, an absolutely fascinating whistle-stop tour through um, the history of Gloucester and particularly, interestingly, all the uh, political manoeuvrings and um, court martials um, that happened in the wake of the disaster. Now, we've got a fair few questions uh, ranging across a number of subjects. Um, so I'll start with one um, from the audience, um, from Hugh Purser. And he asks, do we know anything about those who drowned? Were there any significant historical figures who did not survive? Yes, uh, we do know. In the exhibition, we really tried to do justice to the people that, that, that drowned. We had a memento mori board where we displayed uh, the names of some of the people that we, we know uh, who, who drowned, as well as broken artefacts. And one story, I'm just going to tell one story. It's, I think it's a, a quite a moving story, but hopefully it will sort of stand for all the others. The Earl of Roxburgh, uh, a Scottish noble, a young man, uh, he is travelling on the Gloucester. He's close to James. Um, he's only 22 or 23 at the time. He's one of the few people that James actually asks to come in his rescue boat with him. But for whatever reason, the message doesn't get through. It's 5.30 in the morning. He's not dressed. Uh, we don't know. He doesn't make it onto the rescue boats. Now, Roxburgh can't swim. Um, he ends up in the water. His servant, James Littledale, can swim. He puts Roxburgh on his back um, and they start to swim to one of the rescue boats that one of the, the yachts had, had launched. A third victim grabs hold of Roxburgh, dislodges him. He then sadly immediately drowns. Little Dale does make it to a boat, but then he expires in, in, that, in that boat. Now back at home in Flores Castle, which is where in Scotland where Roxburgh is from, um, his wife, Margaret, Margaret Hay, is devastated at, at this news. She really wants her husband's uh, body back. So she sends her servant, a chap called Ramsay, down to Great Yarmouth. Uh, Ramsay, uh, gets a boat with a chap called John Grice, who is a, um, a, a clockmaker, but also a, a, a very good at, at navigating. They go out to the Gloucester wreck site. So the Gloucester you know, has its mast above water for the whole of that summer. So it, it sort of, it sinks, um, it sinks really quickly and it then lists to starboard and starts to collapse. But all that summer, efforts are being made to, to try and get, you know, some of the, the things that are in the Gloucester or, or find bodies. They look for two weeks. They go up and down the coast. Uh, the Roxburgh body is, is never, sadly, is never found. But Margaret Hayes, also 22 or 23 at the time, she um, lives for another 50 years and she doesn't marry again. But she hates forever James, Duke of York and Albany because of this. So what we have here is a, um, a servant's love for his master and we have a wife's love for her husband. So this has real life consequences that ripple through the nation. 
Thank you, Claire. It's so powerful when you have actual personal stories that you can connect to um, a shipwreck, which often can be quite an impersonal thing when you're just looking at um, objects on the seabed. Um, got a lot of brilliant questions coming through. Um, first one from, in no particular order, from Michael Wadsworth. Will there be a permanent display of the artefacts? That is what the Gloucester 1682 Trust would like to happen. Um, at the moment, uh, uh, that is, you know, uh, uh, not uh, uh, organised, but yes, in due course, uh, with all appropriate permissions in place, uh, that yes, that these would be shared permanently with everybody. As I say, we had an exhibition last year, there, it's possible that we may be able to have uh, further touring exhibitions, there are some discussions underway about that. Uh, to try and you, you know, share these stories properly. But absolutely, the Gloucester 1682 would like to uh, have a heritage centre that does justice, full justice to this story. We'd like it to be in Norfolk. We'd potentially like it to be in Great Yarmouth, which is the closest port to where this, this happened. But if you Thank want you. to know more about that, please do you know, look at the Gloucester Trust website. Did you say that there's currently some artefacts or um, some paintings available at the Time and Tide Museum in Yarmouth? Yes, the Johan Dankert's painting is on display in the Time and Tide Museum uh, in Great Yarmouth at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, Mark Beatty Edwards asks an archaeological question. He says, uh, thank you, Claire, for an interesting lecture. Um, you note that 542 objects have been rescued. Um, can you elaborate what they've been rescued from um, and what the threat is to them and how serious is this threat and how much time is there left to recover other material from the site? Um, I must, I always have to say this, I am not an archaeologist, I'm a historian, so I am, you know, parroting what Gary Momba from Maritime Archaeology Trust has said here, but but uh, my understanding is this is a highly dynamic wreck site with uh, artifacts being uh, exposed and washed away continuously. Um, so there are sand waves migrating across the website, um, the, web the, the wreck site, um, and that is what, uh, 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 they won't be there. When the divers go down, they see them. When they go down again, the diving season uh, in the North Sea runs from, uh, the waters become clear enough from about May to September, October. They're just simply not there. So these are at risk items of, of being washed away. Um, certainly the photogrammetry in 2022, as opposed to the photogrammetry done a few years earlier, shows just how dynamic this is as um, you know, anchor palms are being exposed or or covered over, and you've got you, you know maritime uh, kind of uh, life kind of growing or not growing on on artifacts. Um, from my own experience, it's so, it's so often the case that um, you have once not once a shipwreck is revealed. Um, it's normally because the environment's changing, whether that's climate change or storms uh, or other processes. Um, we have this huge battle between trying to preserve things in situ and um, and make sure we have the resources available to properly study them. And, and obviously an object raised from a shipwreck site loses its context immediately if it's not been recorded, which is why we always say to divers, if you see something on the seabed, don't just pick it up because you don't know how much context you're gonna lose from, from the site. If for instance, a diver found the bell and raised that without knowing it was a Gloucester, you might've lost the one bit of dating evidence you had for that site. But we're always in a race against tide and time. If you leave things on the seabed, you can often um, lose them as well. And that's the battle we always face in archeology. span um, I've got one question, so, so which is those 542 artifacts have been mapped against the wreck site, so their context has not been, um, you, you know, their, their, their context is known. Of course, of course. Um, well, I've got one question, which is sort of more about the context of Gloucester as a ship. Um, we're quite the Royal Navy lost a lot of ships in the restoration period, quite a surprising amount, and we're lucky that we've got a fairly representative sample of them. 
um, thinking about things like the Royal Yacht Mary, which was lost in 1675. Um, we've got the third rate Anne from 1690. We've got um, Dartmouth, which is slightly smaller, fifth rate. We've got the Coronation, um, which is like biggest um, second rate. Is there anything special about the Gloucester as a ship which can add to that body of knowledge of the Royal Navy in this restoration period? We, we, we think there might be. Obviously, until an archaeological excavation is done, it's, it's very difficult to say. But this is a Commonwealth speaker class third rate. Uh, and, and that is, you know, a, a unique uh, wreck. Um, also, what we don't know and what we speculate about is whether the um, carvings, when it is uh, refitted, were you know changed is it we presume it is wearing the livery of the restoration uh, at its stern um with the the, the, the charles ii uh, uh, livery but we don't know what happens at the bow we don't know what the carvings are going to be there we don't know whether we've still got a commonwealth ship with a, a you know a restoration stern interestingly about the gloucester as I'm sure many people here know, so many ships in 1660 are renamed with their Commonwealth names no longer being politically you know, appropriate for the new regime. The Gloucester keeps its original name, named after a, a siege in the Civil War. And that's, of course, because there's a royal connection then as now to, to Gloucester. Uh, there is the younger brother of Charles and James, is the Duke of Gloucester, uh, and he, uh, you know, they're very fond of him. He, he sadly dies quite, quite, quite uh, quickly within the Restoration. But this is a family name, uh, and that's why you know the Gloucester keeps it, its name. But the ship itself, we think within that refit, that that that, that could tell us some really interesting information about how uh, older ships. The ship is twenty eight when it. Uh, about 28 when it when it's lost about how that they are being made and remade that's really interesting um barbara holroyd um apologies if i'm mispronouncing your name asks um in relation to that um what does a third rate ship mean in relation to the gloucester um, the, the rating is normally to do with the, the, the number of cannon that it's carrying. Um, it means first rate, second rate, third rates, fourth rates are all substantial ships, um, but a third rate would normally carry between you know, 50 and 60 cannon. And that's what the Gloucester pretty much carries for all of its working life. First rate, second rates uh, have uh, you know, more cannon, uh, but they're also more men more expensive actually the third rates and the fourth rates are the workhorses uh fourth rates even more than third rates the workhorses of the restoration navy first and second rates tend to only be deployed in times of war because they are super powerful you know fighting weapons uh because of the the, the sheer number of cannon on them but as you can see from that um photogrammetry the, the Gloucester is a pretty potent uh, weapon of, of war. We think it's got 54 cannon simply because there is an account just before it leaves in 1682 saying that a, a broadside of 27 cannon is fired. And so 27 times two is, um, gives you a 52 gun deck. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Um, well, I think, um, with the clock counting down, um, I might, you might call it a day at that point. Um, Claire, thank you very much. That's absolutely um, fantastic um, introduction to Gloucester, um, an account of its history, and um, has some really interesting questions there too. Um, just a brief look ahead to the forthcoming lectures um, in this series. Um, on Tuesday, 27th of February, um, next week, we've got Tour of London, um, Science City from 1550 to 1800. Um, and then on Thursday, 29th, uh, we have How Will We Be Long? How Can a Piece of Music Help Us Think About Next Thousand Years? And then finally, on Tuesday, 5th of March, looking ahead, personal reflections on using management insights from physics and economics to approach pressing societal changes. Um, so an interesting range of lectures um, coming up as well. Um, finally, thanks to all of you, the audience, um, for your interest and engagement. Um, it's really um, 
enjoying to see everyone um, engaging. And thank you again, Claire, for this fascinating talk and discussion. Um, this lecture series will be available online on YouTube in due course. Um, so if you'd like to re revisit anything, and we hope to see you again soon in another lecture in the Knowledge Miles series very soon. Thank you all, and thank you again to Claire, and goodbye. <laughs>